like that. I want to pick up where we left off, excuse me, where we left off uh, last week, and we were talking about uh, fallacies in worship, fallacies in worship, and uh, let's just go ahead and if you'll open your Bible um, this morning, if you would please, uh, to Psalm, let's just open up to Psalm 100, and uh, I'd like to just begin there this morning, we'll read a couple of verses, and we'll pray in the, in the, the order of arrangement of our message this morning is different than usual. Normally, normally I'm preaching through a passage of the Scripture, and we're really looking at what's laid out in the Scripture. And what we're looking, what we're doing today, would be probably more typical of preaching that isn't mine, uh, and that would be looking at uh, words in the Scripture or looking at usages in the Scripture. And uh, I, I'll, I'll qualify that in just a minute. I'll give you a little more of an idea uh, of what we're talking about. <clears throat> Please open up if you're there to. Uh, Psalm chapter, what did I say, Psalm 104? No, 100. Or Psalm 100. That's, I, I turned to Psalm 104 and I can't find the verse that I was looking for. In it. But there we are, 100. We're going to get to verse 4. We're going to read the whole psalm. And this is a praise psalm. Matter of fact, in my Bible, I don't know if yours has the label under it, but each of the psalms in my Bible have the little notes that are written by the Holy Spirit, the, really the author that penned it, and the Holy Spirit gave those. And this one's called a psalm of praise. And so I want to. Uh, look at it this morning. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us this morning as we begin to look at the matter of praise this morning and really try to understand it as part of worship when we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Two words that are not synonyms are praise and worship. You know what a synonym right, is, right? Synonym is a word that means the same thing as another word, or they could be used interchangeably. Praise and worship are not synonyms. Probably if we were to take a test, and I were to ask you for a synonym for praise, you would say worship, or a synonym for worship, you would say praise, but they're not. They're distinct words with their own meanings. Most believers don't know the difference. Matter of fact, uh, what has really prompted me to see the necessity of making this biblical distinction in our series uh, as a fallacy in worship is just reading books on worship. I've read a number of books on worship, and I've been a little bit confused because when I read the books on worship, there's all kinds of things about how to praise or how to worship, but none of those books deal with the meaning of worship. What does worship mean? What does the word worship mean in the Old Testament? Bow down. What? Bow down. To bow down. What does it mean in the New Testament of the Scripture? Pray. To bow down. In other words, the word in the Greek and in the Hebrew, the words for worship have to do with bowing down. <clears throat> have you ever tried to praise bowing down? Have you tried that? Now, <clears throat> could uh, praising be worship? It's a trick question. I got you twice. Got you twice. <laughs> could praising be worship? Yes. yes. Is praising worship? Well, it can be, but it isn't. It doesn't carry with it the whole word. In other words, there are there are concepts in words that uh, that a word could carry. For instance, uh, Tozer said it <coughs> this way. A.W. Tozer. He said something. This is a loose paraphrase. It gets worse every time I paraphrase it. I think it gets looser. <laughs> the paraphrase does. But he talked about the the aspect of admiration in worship. And Tozer said he said you can admire something and not worship it, but you cannot worship without admiration. 
So I can admire something. Matter of fact, <clears throat> I'm a car guy, kind of. I admire a lot of cars. But I don't worship cars. I just don't. I, I really never have. Uh, I, I used to be really into cars and motorcycles and boats and airplanes and anything that goes fast, anything with an engine. And uh, I'm less into that than I used to be. I'm still interested in that. Uh, when I was returning uh, in the airport yesterday in Detroit, they're getting ready for the Dream Cruise, where they have literally hundreds of thousands of classic cars just going up and down Woodward Avenue, and there's all kinds of cars. On my way to the airport yesterday, I was passing, and I saw a lot of cool tractors last week, just, just different things like that, and I enjoyed looking at them. There was a day when I would have wanted to stop and talk to every car owner and look under the hood and uh, you know really check out how he built his car and what, what a job he'd done restoring it and just learn some things and just look at because I was really interested. I'm not that interested anymore, but I've never been interested to the level of bowing down to a car and saying, oh, car. I've never, I've never wanted to bow to any car. I never have. I've heard people say, your car is your idol. To some people, but my cars never, no, no car, <laughs> my cars have never been my idols. If you see my cars, uh, you probably, I, I, I couldn't have a car that'd be my idol, to be honest with you, because I don't bow to cars. Understand that? In other words, I can admire a car, but not worship it. But I cannot admire God, or I cannot worship God and not admire Him. I've met people before that say, you know, I have a hard time liking God. I met some Christians that have said, in the last year I've heard guys say something, and I just think, wish you hadn't said that. It embarrasses me that you're that dumb. <laughs> I heard a guy last year, uh, he's a Christian, he said something to the effect of, I have a very, very hard time with the evil that happens in the world. This is not a guy that's lost and doesn't believe in Jesus, but he says, I have a hard time understanding bad things that happen and really believing that God's good. Well, you know what I was thinking? was that that person has a hard time worshiping God because he doesn't admire Him. He doesn't think God's even good. In other words, unless you think perfect about God, you can't, you can't admire Him. And you're not, you don't worship Him, honestly. Unless you just say, God, Your ways are perfect. As for the Lord, His ways are perfect. perfect. You cannot worship Him. There has to be admiration and worship. And so Tozer said that, and I, I appreciate that statement. He said, you, uh, you can admire something and not worship it, but you cannot worship something and not admire it. That's pretty accurate. Uh, we could say the same thing with the word praise, couldn't we? We could say, you could praise something and not worship it, but you cannot praise something or you cannot worship something without praising. Right? And so you see, admiration is every bit as much a synonym for worship as praise is. In other words, it's an aspect of worship. Admiration is an aspect of worship, and praise is an aspect of worship. One of the great fallacies in worship uh, is that praise is worship. That is, it carries it it encompasses what worship actually is. This is why it is common today for the praise band or the praise group to be considered the worshipers or for that to be considered the worship in the service versus the entirety of the service. I don't have strong conviction on this at this time, but I might get it. And if I do, things will be different. I believe, and I, I, I am convinced, that the entirety of the service is worship. Well, the reason we met today is why? Worship God. God, right? Does anybody here have... I turned it up for Charlie this morning, and we could hear him better, but it's a little too loud for me. Uh, does anybody here have a desire to learn something today? Yeah, did you come because you say, you know, I hope Pastor preaches something that I'll learn. Hope I learn something. Or you didn't just come and say, well, I just want to waste my time. I just want to be there. Uh, so could learning be part of worship? Yes. Sure. sure. It sure could. Uh, is there something about brethren gathering and the Spirit's presence being among them that's part of the worship? 
Yes. We said we're going to talk about individual corporate worship, but corporate worship is very important. That is worshiping together. What happens when we get together to worship God? It's very important. There are a lot of aspects to worship. And uh, so I, you know, I think sometimes I, uh, I think we ought to be really careful about worship. Uh, sometimes I think there's a little bit too much of me in the worship service, a little too much personality. Sometimes I tell stories because y'all are falling asleep. I'm just trying to get you to wake up or laugh or something so I get your attention and we go back to the message. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the story is not about God, it's about me. And that's a little too much, isn't it? Uh, sometimes telling jokes. Sometimes telling jokes can be, uh, <clears throat> or using humor, can be a tool to help with understanding, but sometimes it becomes about the joke or about laughing and not about worship. And that could be a distracting element, couldn't it? Uh, I think about the announcements sometimes. Necessary evil uh, seems to describe announcements. If I could trust you all to read the bulletin, we try to have everything in the bulletin and never announce anything, but it just doesn't seem like... Uh, I, I get this so many times, Pastor, you did not tell us. And uh, so I, I give announcements. I tell people things. Announcements sometimes promote things. Tell you, this is why we're preaching this, or this is why we're doing this. And so we feel like the announcements you know, promote what the church is doing. But if announcements take away the attitude of worship that we ought to have in a service, then you know we need to be careful about announcements. I, I've met, uh, I've been in churches where they wait until the service is over and then they give announcements. And I think that's fine. I think it's good. I always walk out. I just fear I came here to worship, not to hear announcements, so I just leave. So I'm just joking. I don't really do, but I always feel like it. You ever done that? You ever feel like, oh, okay, I'm not here for this. I'm out of here. See if you can come up with a reason to slip to the bathroom and then go out the side door or something. Uh, it's tough to do here. The back, you slip to the bathroom, go out the side door, you'll be locked in the backyard. There's no exit. <laughs> when somebody will come along and click the deadbolt, you'll be out there for a week. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, the announcements aren't really worship unless they're done for the, <coughs> excuse me, for the purpose of worshiping God, God, right? Okay, so now, one of the fallacies in worship is that praise is a synonym of worship. Last week we, we looked at the fallacy of worship being that worship is for me. I'm the beneficiary of worship. We use the word beneficiary. Everybody knows what beneficiary is, right? It's the person who receives the benefits. So I'm the one who is supposed to benefit by worship. I've heard a phrase this way. Uh, you know, that worship really just didn't resonate with me. Ever heard somebody say that? You know, I just, that worship, the worship there, you know, just didn't, I didn't, we used the phrase last week, I didn't get anything out of the service. You ever had somebody, maybe they, they would be too polite to say it, or they think, you know, I don't want to get judged for saying this, but they feel it anyway. I didn't get much out of the service. And the reason they're bothered is because they think that the worship service is for them to benefit by instead of for them to worship God, for God to benefit by. Listen to me. If we are created for God's glory, and if we are created for the express purpose of worshiping Him, who's it about? Who's the beneficiary? God is. Now, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's true, isn't it? Any person who's really ever tried giving knows hands down giving is way better than getting. It really is. Now, it's neat because the way it works with God is that givers get. In other words, you give and God's pleased by it so He gives you so that you can give. So that you can get so you can give. And it just goes on and on. You never... You never give to get, but you always get when you give. That's the way God works. You never, you know, the old saying, you, you, the, it's, it's not in the Bible, it's just some people say you, never, you can't outgive God. It's really just really true. A giver always has to give. And it's just God gives you, you give. And it's really great to give. It's nice to get things, but it's nicer to give things, it really is. 
And so if you worship God and you come with a mindset of, I'm going to give worship to God, do you think that you'll get something? How could you not get something? And that's the problem with most worship. That first fallacy of worship is that most people come to get something. And because they came to get something, they didn't come to give something. And because they didn't give something, they didn't get anything from giving. Does that make sense? Yeah. Worship is about giving. And so we looked at it last week. We looked at uh, the, uh, the another fallacy that I can, because I'm the beneficiary, I can worship how I wish to. And we looked at individuals that tried that. We saw Saul offer a sacrifice to God. Saul offered a sacrifice to God, and how did God receive that? Well, he rejected Saul from being king. Saul tried to be a priest, and God said, no, you're not a priest, but you don't get to be king either. God didn't accept that. We saw uh, Aaron's oldest sons, Hophni, Hophni, and Phinehas, offer incense and unclean fire, profane fire, to God. They just they didn't do it the right way. They do it God's way and take fire from the altar. They just took fire from somewhere else and offered incense to God. And God killed them on the spot. Hophni and Phineas? Yes, Hophni. Wasn't Hophni and Phineas? I thought he was Aaron. Aaron, Eliezer. No, what was his sons? Eliezer and Nadab and Abihu. I'm sorry. I always mix up Hophni and Phineas. They fell into the ground for criticizing Moses. And uh, Nadab and Abihu. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. I was thinking I was saying it wrong. Uh, when, when I said it. I'm sorry. Okay, so Nadab and Abihu, Abihu uh, Aaron's sons, and they died. And worship was so important that even Aaron was, because he'd already been sanctified to be in the temple, he was told, don't mourn. Don't go out of the temple. You stay here and finish your duties. And so the holiness of God and the importance of understanding, you better do it right when you worship God. You don't just do whatever you wish to do. You don't just offer God whatever you want to offer. And it's a reminder of, of when we learned what the definition of worship is, of what Jesus said to the woman at the well when she was saying, our fathers worship in the mountain. We think it's legit. We think God's everywhere, so we can worship God in the mountain. But the Jews say that we have to worship God in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, there's going to come a day when you don't worship here in this mountain or, or in Jerusalem. But he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. Again, God's spirit may be in the mountain, but that isn't where we worship Him. We worship in spirit and in truth. God says worship at Jerusalem, so go to Jerusalem and worship. Worship is not for our convenience. I appreciate when David wanted to repent for his sin of numbering Israel. You remember when he bought Arana's threshing floor? And Arana said, I'll give it to you, David. He was, going to make, he was going to have a sacrifice there, so he went to purchase a, a place to offer a sacrifice to Arana. A-R-A-U-A-N-A-H. Yeah, that's a Hebrew transliteration. And somebody needs to name their kids that, so it's more relatable. Uh, Arana. And when he bought the threshing floor, he said, I will surely buy it if they have a price. He said, neither will I offer sacrifice to God of that which doth cost me nothing. He said, if you give it to me and I give it to God, what am I giving God? Nothing. He said, I want, to pay, I want to pay a lot for it because it's a sacrifice. And so that's another word that defines worship, isn't it? Sacrifice. We don't very often think of going to the sacrifice service, do we, when we go to worship? We think of, I hope I get something from the service. I hope I enjoy the praise. I hope... I hope, I hope, I hope, but we don't very often think about, I'm going to go and I'm going to leave something that cost me something. It's a sacrifice. And these, again, are fallacies of worship. That worship is merely about the praise service. And so I have, um, I have read a lot of, I have read a lot of books about worship and as I read the books, I read from the first chapter to the last chapter, and I don't see a single thing in it that has anything to do with worship. They're books about praise. 99%, I just made up a statistic, so if you want to check it, you'll have to read a lot of books. You have to read all the books and then uh, quantify it. 99% of books on worship 
don't mention worship. They're all about praise. They're all about praise. And they have made praise synonymous with worship. And praise, again, is a word that is part of worship, but it is not a synonym of worship. It's just a part. It's just a part. But most Christians think worship is praise. Matter of fact, they just assume it. They never even bother defining it. I had something similar happen some years past when I went to a prayer conference and they never preached on prayer. Went to the prayer conference and they never preached on prayer. They just preached on, you know, God is sovereign, God does this, and God. they talked about God. And then we had this prayer time. We're all going to get apart and pray. And then the person who put on the conference asked, said, Brother Price, how are you enjoying this prayer conference? I said, well, it would be nice if somebody preached on prayer. And he looked at me like, you know, you dummy, where, you know, where have you been? And uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I've never heard anybody even define what prayer is. Nobody's even said what he said. Well, prayer is like talking to God. No, it isn't. Prayer is asking. I tell, I beg, I request, I entreat. Prayer is begging, asking for something specific. Amen. It's not, hey God, how are you? I'm fine. Just want to let you know I'm having a good day, and I enjoy being in your presence. That's talking to God. That's conversing with God. It's a wonderful thing to have a conversation with God, but it isn't prayer until you ask for God to do something. And it's the same way you read books on prayer and you'll never see prayer defined. You'll never see somebody say, this is what prayer means. And so oftentimes as Christians, we have all these notions and we think we know so much about something because of an experience that we've had or because the way we feel or because of what we wish we, uh, that things were, but we don't even actually know what the word means. So I want to look at praise today. I want to define praise for you with the understanding that one of the fallacies in worship is that praise and worship are synonyms because they're not. And so I'd like to see that. Okay, you ready? All right, verse 4 of chapter uh, 100 in Psalms. We see the word praise enter into his gates with thanksgiving. By the way, is thanksgiving worship? Mm -hmm. Sure, another word, another synonym for that is part of worship, but it has its own meaning. Into his courts with praise. In this, in this uh, instance, praise is a, a song or a hymn of praise. That is, it is adoration or thanksgiving. It's a word, <coughs> excuse me, for praise that means to adore something or to worship something. It's an act of general or public praise. And uh, it is demanded by qualities or deeds or attributes of God. And so we, in this concept, it is God being the object of praise. So in, in this instance, the word praise, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, we would understand that it is speaking to God, speaking, <coughs> excuse me, about God in a praiseworthy fashion or in adoration. And that would probably, wouldn't you agree, kind of be what you would uh, understand the word praise to mean, the way we describe it that way. The word for that in the Hebrew is tehillah. Tehillah. Uh, and it's one of the words in praise. There, there, but there are other words that uh, for, for praise. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. Uh, Genesis chapter 29, the first book of the Bible. I just want to show you all the different... <coughs> just There are literally uh, more than 500 uses of the word praise in the Old Testament of the Scripture. And I just want to give you a sampling of them uh, as di with words that have different meanings. So the word praise isn't all the same thing. Uh, Genesis chapter 29, and this is <coughs> when Leah has her second son. In verse... 35, she conceived again, <coughs> excuse me, she conceived again, bare a son, she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. This word is the word that means to throw or to cast or to shoot, like shooting an arrow, uh, to cast down or to throw down, and it's kind of like plunking something down, like here it is. So, um, you know, it would be sort of like a delivery of something. So Leah is the less loved wife of Jacob. And Rachel, the one that Jacob loved, uh, is barren. She doesn't have children. And so Leah finds 
gratification in her ability to give Jacob sons. You read the next chapter of Genesis, Rachel's upset because she doesn't have children, and Jacob gets angry with her and he says, Am I not more to thee than you know seven sons or to you know a lot of, a lot of sons? In other words, am I not enough for you? Is not is my love for you not enough? So Leah's an unloved individual. And uh, she has a son, his name is Judah, it's her last son that she's gonna bear. <coughs> and she plumps down, says, There it is. That's my praise to the Lord. Now I praise the Lord. In other words, God, you gave me a son. It's almost like the idea of a cash payment for something. Uh, in other words, do you, do you have that you go to buy something? I don't know what you all buy. You know, maybe you guys find a shady guy on, on Craigslist selling a Ro Rolex watch for cheap. Okay? And you, the guy shows up and you say, did you bring the Rolex? And he throws it on the table. There it is. And he says, did you bring the cash? And you throw it on the table. And there it is. And that's kind of the word for praise here. You know, to throw down or to cast or to put. And it sort of carries with it the idea of an obligatory kind of a thing like, okay, you gave me a son, here's praise. And it's used in that instance many, many times. That's the way Leah is using for the word praise. There are more words for, or more usage, or more words that are uh, defined as praise in the Old Testament of the Scripture. Uh, in Judges <coughs> chapter 5, there's the word Barak. Uh, Barak. Uh, and uh, the last word was Yadah. Yadah. And uh, Judges, what did I say? Judges chapter 5. Um, and down at verse 2. This is after Deborah and uh, Barak have. Um, no, yeah. Have uh, conquered Israel. Or not conquered Israel, have delivered Israel. And uh, the glory's gone to a woman. Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Okay, let's read that again. Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Now, praise whom? Who is the object of praise? Lord. The Lord. And it's an interesting thing that the people willingly offered themselves and God avenged Israel. And it was God had done something for Israel. And the word here is very, very similar to the word worship. It means to kneel. It's barak, to kneel or to bow. To kneel or to bow. It's not the same word as the word for worship, but it's very similar. In other words, this kind of praise isn't throw out something or give something because God's deserving of it, it is bow down. And so praising involves, as worship does, bowing down. We were in need of deliverance and God delivered us. We offered ourselves and God delivered us and we bowed down. You see, when the people uh, willingly offered themselves. And so this type of praise is a bowing or a uh, offering type of praise. It's not a throwing out, not a... Uh, and I think of the throw out as throwing it out, out something, uh, like an individual shouting out something. Wish Taj were here this morning. He is. A couple of years ago, the Atlanta Hawks, Taj's basketball team, uh, traded... Or they made a deal with Dwight Howard for way too much money. And uh, Dwight Howard in his day was a great basketball player, but he's from Atlanta, and it was like I'm coming home kind of thing. And I teased him a lot about how great the Atlanta Hawks were going to be because they had Dwight Howard. We were going to men's retreat, and uh, we're, you were there, right, Charlie? We're in Atlanta Airport coming out of our terminal and going down. You know how you go to the big escalator, and you end up riding the tram all around from terminal to terminal. And there are literally... It's just body to body of people going down the escalator, coming up the escalator, going up and down the stairs. I mean, probably a thousand people, like in just this crammed in section where we're going down. All kinds of people there. And Taj is on a, there's, there are two escalators going down. He's on one over here. And so I look over at Taj and I shouted at the top of my lungs, 
I said, I always call him Dwight Howard instead of Dwight Howard. I said, this is the city where Dwight Howard lives. And I yelled it out, and everybody just starts going, Whoa! you know, whatever. But in other words, I didn't just look over Todd and say, this is the city where Dwight Howard lives. I said it for everybody to hear. I mean, I threw it out there. I cast it out there. And that's kind of the idea of praise. Uh, when it's the throw or cast, there's the bow down, there's the plunk down, then there's the throw out there kind of praise. So it would be very similar um, back when Chris Callahan used to go here. One of the songs that he would just beller. He was the king of bellering, and he could just really sing. Uh, he lives. He lives, he lives. And another one was Jesus saves. And I always said when we were in our last location, I wish we'd done it, that sometime we're going to take the whole congregation, we're going to go stand on the second floor out there, and while people are going to buy it, we're going to sing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. In other words, we're going to just shout it. You know, shout to nations full and free, and to just shout it, Jesus saves. It isn't much to say that Jesus saves um, when there are one or two people. But it would be kind of cool if we were in a room where there were just a thousand Christians assembled for something and somebody just got up and just shouted, Jesus saves! And just let everybody know. You ever been in a place where somebody decided to tell everybody something? I did it to Dwight Howard one time in a basketball game in Miami. I was with Tosh. Tosh took me to a basketball game to watch Dwight Howard play the Miami Heat. And Dwight Howard was shooting free throws. And uh, we were quite a ways away from him. I have a loud voice. We were up a couple, you know, a couple tiers, and Dwight Howard's down here shooting, and I'm standing up here. And I shouted, and I said some things to Dwight Howard. I said, your shoes are pink and your free throws stink, or something like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he was wearing pink shoes for uh, the breast cancer awareness, or whatever. And everybody heard me. <laughs> I mean, literally... And the, the stands just started roaring, and he missed his free throw, I think. So I, I'm sure it was because of me, you know, and, and my heckling as a fan. So anyway, but I, I have a good time at games, and it isn't about the sport. It's about the activity. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, your shoes are pink, and your free throws stink or something like that. And I shouted, and, and I, I said Dwight Howard at it. And he heard me. Dwight Howard heard me. I mean, all the way down there, in spite of all the stands and all the noise and everything, because I got up in a crowd and I shouted it. And that's kind of the idea of praise here. In other words, it isn't like a, you know, let's praise the Lord. I want to praise the Lord, brother. I want everybody here to know I have something to praise the Lord for. And you tell people. In other words, it's a very, throw it out there kind of a thing. I want everybody to hear this. I want everybody to know. You ever see one of those proposals? You know, a guy proposes on a bulletin or, a, or on, a, on a big, uh, you know, the jumbotron or something like that. You know, it's an easy thing to do. Guys don't recommend it. Uh, but, you know, he wants, in other words, he wants to not only propose, but he wants to propose. And, I want everybody to know I want you to be my wife. And I'm willing to be publicly shamed when you say no. I like the ones watching watch <laughs> say no and that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, Barack is Neil. Uh, <coughs> And uh, we had a former president by that name, by the way. His name means praise. To praise by kneeling or bowing down. So for you folks that say it's a Muslim name, it's a Hebrew name. All right. Uh, there's Zamar. Zamar. Let's, we're in... Uh, um, okay, I'm sorry. I missed... I missed... I did one wrong here. Okay, there's Judges 5.2. And then verse 3. There's another... In, in, in the same context, there's a different word. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes, I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. How many of y'all have a King James Bible here today? That word praise. Can you tell me anything about it in your King James Bible? It's in italics. What does that mean in the King James Bible when a word is in italics? No. What? It's an extra word. Which means that it's it is that the word that is translated isn't doesn't carry the whole meaning in it, and so it's an extra word to help you understand. It's the word sing praise. Sing praise. I will sing praise. The word praise 
is what is sung. But singing is praising here. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that praise is an aspect of singing, but oftentimes we think that singing is the full aspect of praising. And really, praise is here defined uh, really more as, as singing, but the word really is sing. But it is qualified by what is sung, and that is praise. In other words, singing is a way, a medium for praising. In other words, it's a method of praise. So a guy could read praise, couldn't he? As well as he could sing praise. A guy could write praise or speak praise as well as, in other words, the idea that singing is praise isn't so. Many people think that praise is worship. Many people think that singing is worship. Both of those are methods or, or mediums, that is, the, the, what is being used to carry worship. That's all they are. A lot of people think singing is worship. But singing is a way to praise. Or it's a type of praise. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> some other words for praise in the Scripture... But you didn't know that praise has that many different definitions, did you? Has that many aspects? There's a lot of aspects to praise. We're, we're, we're not even close uh, to being done with this, I'm sorry to say. Second Chronicles chapter 8. <coughs> Second Chronicles chapter 8. This is the Chronicles of the Kings where they uh, talk about what each, <coughs> each of the kings did. Second Chronicles 8. And uh, verse 14, this is speaking of Solomon. Uh, and he appointed, according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their services, and the Levites to their, excuse me, charges. And this is after he built the house of the Lord, the temple. Uh, to praise and minister, <coughs> excuse me, before the priest, as the duty of every day required, the porters also by their courses at every gate, for so had David, the man of God, commanded. Huh. Where did praise in the temple originate? Well, Solomon appointed praise singers, individuals that um, ministered before the priest. Minister is to, to serve <coughs> and uh, these Levites' job was to praise and minister before the priest. Now this word for praise is uh, the word halal, which means to shine, or to flash forth, uh, or to praise, or to boast, or to be boastful. So it was sort of, I'm going to be a little irreverent about this. And I hope it, it won't be taken the wrong way, or I don't, I don't intend to be really irreverent, but to, for us to understand it. The priests in the temple are carrying about their business. And there, there's a whole tribe of Levites, a whole tribe of Israel, who are Levites. They don't have a land inheritance, and they're supposed to have jobs that have to do with the temple, that have to do with you know, offering and worshiping God and their servants in it. And Levites are called ministers. <coughs> now, minister is not a fancy title. Minister is a word that just means one who serves. So these Levites, their job in the temple was basically like you the band, Glory to God! <laughs> I've preached at services before where people are shouters. Uh, we're, we're just too far south down here. Up south, uh, where the real south is, it gets noisy in church. And uh, I've preached in places. You can point at a guy and he'll say his thing. You look at him and say, Amen! You know, it's like you can trigger him just by pointing at the guy. You know, say, so let's try it here today. You're amen. You ready? Give us a good one. Amen. Oh, very good. Good. I like this guy. Okay, amen. What's yours, Charlie? Make one. Give us a southern one. Uh, a southern. Quick. Don't think too hard. What? Glory to God. Okay, so you're glory to God. And uh, you're going to be shake that bush. Okay, just shake that bush. Or how about this? Shake that bush, and Frank, you're, there's a rabbit in that hole. Okay? So, you know, when the preacher starts chasing rabbits, say, there's a rabbit in that hole, brother. Go get him, okay? So, amen. Glory. 
Shaking that bush. There's a rabbit in the hole. <laughs> rabbit in the hole. Rabbit in that hole. There's a rabbit in that hole. Okay. It gets rowdy in the south. Up south. I'll tell you so. You ready? All right? Lord. Rabbit in that hole. Shake that bush. Amen. Okay. All right. So in the temple, the Levites had the job of praise. Boasting about God. Okay, so let's try boasting about God. Um, what's an attribute you admire about God? Yeah, he's good. God's always good. Okay, what's an attribute you admire about God? Uh, his mercy. He's always merciful. But what's an attribute you admire about God? The simplicity of the gospel. Ah, man, anybody can believe the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. What's an attribute? He's faithful. He's faithful. Okay. He's constant. He's constant. Okay, so let's try. It, all right. Constant. <laughs> you forgot what you said? You forgot when you said God's good. He's always good. He's good. Yeah. He's good. Mercy. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Okay. No, it's, uh, oh, the no, it's simplicity of the gospel. It's easy to believe. In easy Jesus. to believe. Yeah. He's faithful. He's faithful. Okay. So now if I just had you guys set up and, and I could just cue you for the worship service, your job was to just say this about God. That's the idea of the Levites in the temple. They were to boast of God's goodness. To boast about God. Just say, these are things about God, and we're bragging on God. You know, we're bragging on God. Well, that's the idea, and that's the word for praise here. Is to boast or brag about God's goodness. So praise, <clears throat> when we understand praise, and by the way, I wish I could read a book about praise I wish I could read a book about praise that talks about praise as used in the Scripture because usually when we're talking about with praise, we're talking about worship when we're talking about worship being praise and actually nobody ever bothers to define anything. When you bother to define anything, look at what the word even means. That's too bad, isn't it? If we're made to worship God and if praise is an aspect of worship, we ought to understand what both of them mean and know it pretty well. Aren't we? Okay, let's look at just a couple of more things and uh, then we'll be started. I don't want to say we'll be finished because that's not nice. So, um, Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, this, is, this is a great context. Ephesians chapter 1 in the New Testament. This is the Greek word in the New Testament. Let's read all the way up to verse. One, because Paul really writes a boast about God. His verses 1 through 6 is really a praise or a boasting of God. I see Charlie grinning. I know why. All right. Charlie, why is it, why is it uh, that you have to boast? What is it you have to boast about God for? He's good. He's good. So, yeah, he's good. I'm glad you remember that. All right. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are Ephesus, at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now when Paul begins to speak of God, he's, he's bragging on God here, isn't he? Amen. You see this, blessed be. According as He hath chosen us in Him <coughs> before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him, in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good will of His or pleasure of His will, comma, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Now he's boasted about God, but then he uses the word here for praise. And uh, this is the word, one of the two words in the Greek that's commonly used, epinos, or pinos, uh, which is approbation or commendation. In other words, a commendation, have you ever seen a, a special ceremony where a commendation is given or received by someone? Sports aren't a good example of it because there really isn't anything really super commendable about a game. But when I think of commendations, I think of the military. I think of individuals that, you know, they did more than you could ask them to do. They did Anybody, any person who understands what he's doing when he goes into uh, the military understands that he, he is basically offering himself for his country. When you, and I admire our military men for that, for that reason. Just 
guys that just want to serve in the military, not guys that don't get free education, and then they get upset when they get in because, you know, they find out that there are firearms and there's combat. You know, but guys that say, you know something, I don't want to die, I don't have a death wish, but somebody needs to do something, and I'll, I'll do it. And they offer themselves for their country. And uh, have you, anybody here ever uh, read books about Sergeant York? Ever watch the, the old movie about Sergeant York? Watch the movie, it's easy. Uh, but the book is a lot better. The movie's not exactly accurate. But Sergeant York was a guy who actually conscientiously objected at first to going into the military, and then his pastor talked to him about the importance of serving his country and gave him perspective on it. And uh, he ended up <coughs> going into the military in World War II and ended up not only just saving his battalion, but ended up capturing, what, what was it, something like 200 Germans that he captured by himself? He captured like 200, and one guy. And just, it was just, it's an amazing story what he ended up doing, risked his life. And because of that, he received medals, which were commendations. In other words, commending him for what he'd done. In this instance, praise is a commendation for a God who, before he ever created man, was so responsible that knowing that man could sin against him, God had provided a plan to redeem man to himself. And that kind of a God deserves commendations. That's the word for praise here. It's the word commendation. Pinos, epinos. Uh, commendation or to commend, uh, to praise. Uh, one other word we're going to look at today, and that's the word I know. And uh, this would <coughs> be in Revelation. Go to the last book of your Bible. This is the last verse we'll look at today. Revelation chapter 19. And we'll look down at <coughs> uh, the second part. Let's just start in verse 1 because this is a voice praising God. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, <coughs> Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Hallelujah! And a voice, <coughs> I'm, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> and a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard it as it were, the voice of a great multitude. So verse 5, a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God. And of course this would uh, be in the, the active. And this is to extol, or to sing praises in honor, or a word for praise is to promise or to vow. To promise or to vow, and that would set it apart uh, from the word uh, epino, which uh, you know means to commend. This word carries with it the word to commend, but it is commend with a commitment. All illustrations fail and are a little weak, so forgive this one. But I'm bothered by people on the streets who are homeless veterans. It's just one group of homeless people that I don't like to see on the, on the streets. And sometimes uh, I think that they have problems which were created by their service, mm -hmm. homeless veterans. I'll tell you, PTSD is a real thing. Post-traumatic, uh, what is it, uh, stress disorder. I mean, it's, it's real, and it messes pe people because of what they did in service of their country got messed up. It, it, it affected them, and it messed up their lives. And uh, sometimes injuries and so forth got them addicted to drugs. They got on something for pain, and then it, you know, it just it, it, it got them in, into drugs. It got them addicted to drugs, and they're in a real mess. And it really bothers me. I don't know about you, but it bothers me. And uh, I want to do something for our veterans. In other words, if somebody is a veteran, he's on the and, and he's a drunk, or he's a drug addict, and he's on the side of the road. And he tells me, I'm a Marine. Thank you for your service. I don't care if he's drunk and on the side of the road. I'm thankful for a Marine that served. Or is he to give him his props. He deserves that. And uh, I'm not going to help him buy drugs or 
alcohol or anything like that. But I think we ought to do something to help a guy. If we can figure out how to help the guy, I think we should. Because it doesn't really mean anything if I say thank you for your service if I don't do anything to show gratitude. If I don't do anything, if I don't put actions to my words. Commendations aren't just words. Commendations are actions to the words. If I were to say something like, I'm going to be here every morning uh, with coffee and an apple. That'd be something, wouldn't it? And you say, Pastor, you probably don't want, yeah, most guys don't want coffee and an apple. But if I promised something like that, that would be a commitment to say, I'm thankful for your service. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it isn't just words, it's there's something to it. And again, all the illustrations fall short. God is not a drunken, uh, whatever, homeless person on the, on the, on the corner. It's not a put down. There's nothing like that. In other words, all illustrations fall short because God's a perfect God who before man was ever created had a plan of redemption. Who never forced His will on anybody. Who never said, you'll love me no matter what. He said, love will be a choice. And you'll have the opportunity to sin or not sin. And when man sinned, he had an opportunity. He had a way at his own expense for man to be redeemed by the sacrifice of his own lamb. And this is what Paul is saying here. God is something. And uh, then, I'm sorry, we're in the John passage, not in Ephesians anymore, in John. Um, in Revelation, where God has just destroyed uh, the, the great whore who is destroying uh, the Israelites. And he's done this great deed in the heavens, the people that are in the heavens, the saints, are praising Him and saying, Alleluia. But their praise comes with it a, we will worship You. We will commit to You. God, we will worship You. We'll commit to worshiping You as You are. Give ourselves to You. And there's a commitment to the praise. You know, most praise is pretty noncommittal, actually. I think a lot of times... Instead of talking about what we'll do because of what God has done, we just want to talk about what God has done and walk away because we don't want to commit ourselves in our praise. This is rather loose and rather jumbled what we've looked at today, but I hope it's, I hope it's helpful. I hope it's, um, I hope it's an education for us on worship. I hope it's something you'll take home and say, okay, there's something here that I need to wrap my mind around and grasp so I can know how to worship God. So I can understand what praise is. If we're created to worship God, does it not go without saying that we should be willing to go to any length to worship God? Do you feel for the Samaritan woman when she's told you have to worship at Jerusalem? Do you know what it would be? for a Samaritan to worship at Jerusalem. Walk into Jerusalem and everybody says, you don't belong here. You're a Samaritan. Not comfortable, is it? The cost of travel, the danger of travel, the time away, what it would take to bring a sacrifice to Jerusalem. You think about what it would mean for a Samaritan to go to Jerusalem to worship. And so they did. They worshipped in the mountain. Because it was not convenient for them to worship God His way. If you had to take your worship, that is, the way that you worship or the way that your worship is defined, and you just had to say, God, my worship can be anything you say it is. Might it not cost you the same way? I think of the men of Israel who are required three times a year to go up before the Lord and present themselves. You know, if you're local to the tabernacle, it's not such a big deal. Let's go over to the tabernacle. But if you're on the outskirts 
of Israel on the coast, we're talking about travel. We're talking about time away. We're talking about peril and danger. We're talking about logistics that make it much more. And you know, for most of us, worship is a compartment of our lives. In other words, it's, well, I'll do this. This is what I'll do for worship. And we package it and present it. And we seldom think that whatever God says worship is, He'll get it. If you love your wife, what do you do for her? Husbands, if you love your wife, what do you do for her? Anything. Anything. Right? Anything. Can I ask you something? Anybody afraid when your wife says that? Can I ask you something? Could you do something for me? Why don't they say, I'd like this and this and this. Could you do that? No, they don't. They say, can I ask you something? You know, and you think of, you know, it will be given unto thee even the half of my kingdom. You know, it probably will be half of my kingdom. All right. Yeah. Oh, boy. If you love your wife, it's just a matter of, it's a matter of, of presenting the request, isn't it? Right? If it's good and she needs it, it's not a matter of yes or no. It's a, just a matter of doing it. If you love her, isn't it? And that's what worship ought to be for us. If you love God, it shouldn't be, well what, well, what is it that, you know, what is it you want? It ought to be, God, you have everything, and when I find out what it is, you'll get it. I got married that way, honestly. You know, the vows in marriage for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others. It doesn't mean anything if it doesn't mean everything. Does it? It doesn't mean anything if it doesn't mean everything. That's what you said. And when it's time to deliver on it, it should, it should just be, I already committed that. I think God would be glorified by that kind of worship, wouldn't it? Just throw all your worship up. All of it. Everything that you call worship, just put it on a pile. And then let God evaluate and have Him say, that's what I want. Or just take your worship and just throw it in the garbage can and say, okay, God, you're going to define worship. Whatever it is, you'll have it. Yesterday, my wife and I went to the funeral. You may have seen in the news, uh, uh, beginning of this month, July 8th, there was a bad car crash, a lady in uh, Georgia, uh, her, a mother with three children in a van and uh, she died and two of the children died and one little boy. So my wife and I, she, my wife went to school with her and as good friends with her sister and so forth. So we went to that funeral yesterday in Detroit, or not in Detroit, but in Michigan. And um, that was made quite an impression on you. Well, something that always, I'm always impressed by when somebody young dies, of course you have a 15 year old and a 13 year old and uh, you know, I think 40, 42 year old that are gone and uh, you know people always think too soon right too young so young and uh, I've been to a lot of those and I don't like to go to funerals like that to be honest with you because it's it's tough. I'm an emotional person some of you don't know this but it, it's crushing it's really it's tough to, to see and to watch even though you know they're in heaven something something like that does for me is it gives me um, a reminder of the reality of eternity in other words, the comfort for me in a time like that when they're believers and they were believers, the comfort for me is that it isn't very long until I'm there. Separation is a cause of sorrow, but it's a temporary separation because eternity is forever and life's pretty short compared to it. <coughs> Literally, if you have been with the Lord for a thousand years, you've been with the Lord a lot longer than we've been on this little earth. A lot of times I think that we are holding on to our worship instead of letting worship be what God says it is. It's because we just think we're going to lose something and we forget that eternity is forever and that this life is very temporary. We're not willing to let go of something. is because we really have our eyes too fixed on temporary things and we don't have our eyes on eternal things. Eternal matters are of some consequence. Is that an understatement? Eternal matters are really all that matter. 
eternal things are all that really matter. And sometimes things give you a perspective where you just think, you know what? If it isn't exactly what God wants, and if it doesn't matter for eternity, then it doesn't matter at all. And it doesn't have any value. If my worship is for me, my friend, it's worthless. It's temporary. It may bring, give me something. <clears throat> I may benefit by it somehow, but I'm not supposed to be the beneficiary of worship. God is. And my friend, if you'll worship God in spirit and in truth, it will matter eternally. And I think that is a vast, utmost importance. God, please help us as we endeavor to understand worship. God, help us as we apply as we apply this matter of praise, <coughs> which is only an aspect of worship. Help us, God, to be willing to just take our notions, our will, and our purposes, and to be able to just sweep them aside and help us with open arms to embrace your notions, your desires, your will. Help us in a worship to say, not my will, but thine. Bless and move in the invitation now, we pray in Jesus' name. Just a minute, we're going to have an invitation, and we have not uh, had a come forward or go back invitation in a few weeks, and that's because we haven't felt led. I think in a worship service, it's very imperative for us to be careful not to do anything just because it is a tradition, but to do something instead because of the value in it and because it's on purpose. It really isn't worship if it isn't well thought, is it? So I think we should have a uh, I think we should have an invitation today. We're in our third week in the series, and the invitation is going to be really simple this morning. If God has spoken to your heart, if He showed you something in the last couple of weeks, it might be that He's shown you, you know what? This isn't what it ought to be, and He is He is in the process of transforming your thinking. But it might be that even in that time that God's showing you, maybe you're holding on to something. Maybe it will push you out of your comfort zone. You may be afraid that in a couple of weeks we're going to start uh, having a time of bowing in our service. Or pastors, get, we're going to do something weird to, because it, we're supposed to for worship and that makes me uncomfortable. It might be that this is what you want and it might be that God says, I don't want that and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to eradicate it. You're going to have to get it out of your life because it isn't true worship. If God's dealing with you about something like that, I suppose that the Holy Spirit of God is putting His finger on you. He's putting his finger on specifically that thing and he's spoken to you about it. And you know what it is, but you haven't made the decision to do something about it. That's what the invitation's for. God, I've decided I'm going to do this. It might be during the invitation, it could be a matter of, you know what, <clears throat> this whole worshiping God thing. Uh, I'm not sure I'm his child to begin with. I don't know that I'm born again, that I have heaven for my eternal home, that that's a guarantee. I don't know that. And so uh, that's the matter that I need to take care of. If, that's for, if that would be the truth for you, we'd be able to help you with that during the invitation. But we're going to have a song of invitation this morning. It's going to be in your hymn books. It's going to be uh, page 242. We're just going to sing, Jesus, I Come. Sing it if it's true. If it isn't true, then would you make it true during the invitation by doing business with God? You could kneel right where you're at. If you need someone to pray with you, I'll take time, uh, even while we're singing, to uh, take a moment with you. And uh, you say to God, you deal with God about what He's dealt with you about. That's the invitation this morning. We're inviting you to make a decision on the basis of what God's shown you so far. Will you please stand to your feet if you're physically able to do so? We're going to sing Jesus I Come, page 242 in the Blue Hand Book, before we close our service.